Boehm. Hello and welcome to the Executive Protection Lifestyle Podcast. This is the number one podcast in the executive protection game. And this is the largest free real world library of executive protection content in existence. So sit back, relax, dig in and enjoy the show. While we honor the slogan that executive protection is more than just a job, ladies and gentlemen, it really is a lifestyle. Boom. Boom. What's going down, family? It is officially time for the season three mash up, right? So in this episode, we're continuing this series. I think this series is amazing. I love it. We're pulling content from each season and making like a mashup of many of the best moments of the podcast. So, you know, I just don't want these, these, these episodes to be like shots out there that it just don't live on, man. So we're bringing them back up. In this episode, you'll get to listen to some of the best interviews we had, the highest ratings we had in season three of the number one podcast in the executive protection industry, the Executive Protection Lifestyle Podcast. So sit back, relax, enjoy it. It's probably better if you watch it on YouTube. And uh, if you guys need anything in Cali or Texas, reach out to Bravo Research Group. It's an honor to work with you guys, white label for you guys, join forces with you guys. Sit back, relax, enjoy. Much more to come. God bless. Semper Fi. Remember, protection is more than just a job. It really is a lifestyle. Let's go. I find that a lot of people that come on this uh, podcast with me are like um, teachers and empowerers. They're people that are just about empowering others. And it's a lot of times it's a strong human in whatever there is, their gift is. They're usually a strong person that lives to try to get that strength or that skill or that ability into other people. 100%. 100%. That's a, that's a good capture. I like how you frame that. And seeing the people we have on this show, you know, I know that's true 110%. Um, and it really just kind of grabs me as you you deal with producers, Byron. You are a producer. You bring producers onto this show. You're, you're network with producers. So people who want to go out there and not take not just be, you know, intaking things, but actually producing things, making people better. Um, that's a fantastic voyage to be on. And, and again, thanks for allowing me to be within the caliber of the people in the, the oxygen in the room is fantastic. So <laughs> can't we get to do that? That's awesome. That's hilarious. <laughs> the oxygen in the room is fantastic. Rare air out here, my friend. Rare air. <laughs> Thank you, man. That's, that's awesome feedback. That's awesome feedback. Yeah. And no, I, it's, it's an honor to be able to be a, be a conduit or at least have these conversations <clears throat> that I probably wouldn't otherwise get an opportunity to have, you know, um, but to be able to bring this content to people, is, it's an honor, man. Yeah. Um, have you, would you say that you have changed your content uh, as a result of these active human threat, kind of all these active human threat things that you've been seeing? Has it changed the way you guys do, you do, you look at things and teach or? Most definitely. Most definitely, Byron. So, I mean, to give you my ulterior motive, yeah, training is vital. I've seen this training work for years and years and years. I've trained thousands of people in this stuff even before I started the business. So what I want to do is gather as many people to hear this message as I can. So the, the biggest range I can. So what I've actually done is where I modified. I took out a lot of some of the scary militaristic stuff. And that's just the name of the game. You, me, the people we roll around with, we're ready to rock and roll, you know, no problem. We have the mindset for that, but a vast, a huge majority of the population is, you know, honestly just not mentally prepared for that. All right. So what do I do? Do I go hardcore? Do I hit them with all the tactical stuff? Like, Hey, welcome to like murder, death, kill LLC, you know, mm-hmm. so, um, canoe people in the head and like your average citizens going, Whoa, wait a minute. That's a lot of information here. So I've tried to take out some of the scarier stuff and, build in more, you know, thought provoking things, more emotional based response to get people motivated instead of going, Oh my God, this is scary training or whatever it is to stand back and go, you know, damn it. Maybe I'm not as trained as I thought I was. Maybe I need to do some more training. And what's great. You're actually starting to see the effects of it in my students, my instructors that I'm, I'm training right now, a whole bunch of them have either tactical training businesses or training businesses of some type. And so, felt that same kind of thing with me. They have their core audience of people that have to get their training. Let's say they teach firearms or whatever it is. They have their core group audience, but if they just clean it up a little and expand out, they can bring in a whole larger audience to get that mindset training. 
So now I'm starting to see them do it. I'm encouraging them to do it. So they'll go in, they'll go to an organization or group of people. They'll teach them the situation awareness skills. And that's where the light bulb, that's kind of the bridge to get them into the other side of the mindset to go, okay, wait a minute, maybe I do need some more training. And then go, oh, if you do, come on down. We have that type of training. So that's how I've really modified um, that stuff. The core science, the research behind it relative, stays relatively the same. I mean, this stuff was... Um, studied and figured out uh, all the way back starting in the 1940s, 1950s, when we break down like behavioral indicators and whatnot, it's just packaged in a way to give people that proactive mindset to take a step back, take a stock of what their training level actually is at that point. All right. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, man. No, that's, that's fantastic. You were mentioning going in and like kind of opening people's eyes to the reality that they need training for being kind of part of the conduit and what starts people on that journey of seeking more training. Mm -hmm. Um, What would you say, is there anything that you would want the listeners to think about that might show them that like, Hey, you know what, maybe I do need to to train a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, it just goes back to your every day, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, our, our brains operate in autopilot a lot, a lot of the time. And it's (laughs) scary how often they, they operate in autopilot and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Your brain is trying to do that to preserve energy, preserve resources. You can't, you know, take in all information all the time. It doesn't work. I'll tell my what would happen if your brain downloaded all the information you took in uh, in one day, 24 hours, you know, it'd be like if you were surfing the internet or watching Netflix and you downloaded everything you saw on the internet, what would happen to your computer? It, just freeze. <laughs> explode. Yeah. If you tried to do that with your brain, you'd be in the back corner trying to lick your own elbow in a couple of hours, you know? Um, so instead of trying to be like, oh, you need to focus on everything all the time, that's kind of paranoia. I don't want to, that. I want to tamp things down. So instead of being paranoid and looking for threats everywhere, let's use research-based behaviors and look for specific pre-event indicators and focus our attention. You know, I tell people all the time, when you wake up in the morning and this is a hypothetical, you know, you wake up in the morning, you get gifted like a thousand dollars of currency, you know, a thousand dollars of attention currency, right? So if you spend that attention currency by 10 o'clock in the morning, guess what? Your brain taps out and Murphy's law will tell you, you're going to not be paying attention or you're going to burn out right when you need to be looking at that specific indicator or that specific threat, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it's easy. The deck is definitely stacked against us with all the stuff our brain gets distracted with at any given point. The fact that most people, most people, our community members are not walking around in like a highly non-permissive environment. There's not threats everywhere. So it's a little bit, you know, when you're in a combat, when you're an executive protection agent, it's easy to go, Hey, head on a swivel. Let's go. It's game time. You know, Uh, how hard is it to flip into that mindset when it's your every day? So it's just about being, I, I, I tell people to be very deliberate with their observations. Don't get into paranoia. Don't, don't be into fear-based thinking. Use fear. Fear is a gut feeling. Fear is there for a reason. It's a survival mechanism. It's trying to tell you, pay attention, but don't get that letter rule you and um, don't get too distracted and use research-based repeatable things to look at it on a given day. Heck yeah. So like one of the things that I always get on my on my Instagram when I'm posting all these like real world combat engagements is people are like, you can't just be ready all the time and you're just going to be paranoid all the time. And I'm like, eh, nah, like it's not there. Yeah. I mean, I feel safer once I have a plan. Yep. I do little simple things to help it not take so much bandwidth to be able to watch and pay attention. And there's, just, I don't know, what would you say to that person who's like, there's no way you could have saw that coming because you would have to be paranoid always. Yeah. Go, go to my Facebook group, go to anywhere you see me, you know, where we're doing stuff and you'll see people on there. You're teaching people PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> and I am not teaching people PTSD, you know, and it's good because other people will jump on and go, this is not what this guy's talking about. But like once a week, someone's like, you're teaching people to have PTSD. We don't, I don't need more PTSD. It's like, that's so good. <laughs> I'm trying to dial that that down, you know, you think of, you think of the concept of a needle in a haystack, you know, Mm -hmm. threat is the needle and we're walking around in the haystack. Am I, do I want to teach you to build a bigger haystack? You know, that's what you're doing when you're being paranoid and you're, you're looking for threats or you're building a bigger haystack. It's still the same tiny little needle you got to find, 
but you're adding all this extra stuff into it that might not be there. So what you said, Byron, what you have processes you put in place. You have processes so it doesn't take much bandwidth. You automate some of these observations and you're not reacting to it. You're being proactive. Once you're proactive, you can put a lid on things. You can get ahead of it, you know? Uh, so that's just my only comment. I try to educate people. I go, look, this is an Uncle Jim Bob's behavior analysis. It's kind of hard. You're still new and kind of up and coming because people yeah. believe it's real. You know, either they come in and say you're teaching people PTSD or like they, they call it. Yeah. How about, you know, combat obvious? How about just pay attention, bro? I'm like, <laughs> more complicated than that, you know? Yeah. So security work there is um it's real security work, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like you can just hang out with your client day and like nothing happens. You get to be cool and like yeah. relax. Like you things happen. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, what I've been through um, is a weekly occurrence. You know, if I say weekly, um, all around the country, there's probably four to five cash and transit heists. These type of robberies where we escorted um, courier companies and courier delivery vans and so forth, it happens weekly. Um, it is not even something that will you know, reach the fifth page in the newspaper and front page news and things like that. It is a um, South African public is so desensitized to violence that now, as long as it doesn't happen to you, or your close family, uh, you don't want to have anything to do with it. But um, it happens all all around us every day. Wow, um, it's just, and that's why I love doing these podcasts to understand kind of the international realities that other professionals experience. You know, I think one of the things that we may suffer from, if I can use, I don't know if that's the right word, but I'm just going to go with it. Uh, the United States and some um, components of private security uh, is that nothing will happen for such a long time. Nothing may never may ever happen, you know, over the yeah. course of a whole entire career. And I think sometimes agents and companies can think, and sometimes it is a metric of competence. Sometimes it does prove that you're doing your job. But at the same time, if you're never testing your systems, how do you know that you're doing your job? <laughs> you know? sure. Yeah, no, um, I think, you know, again, for all the wrong reasons, we've, we've got some systems and um, our training is, is focused in the right places to give the guys the optimal opportunity to survive incidents like that. You know, real life scenarios and real life experience can't be bought and can't be trained really. You can you can be as good as you want to be in training, and your you know your scenario training, your force on force, all can be as as realistic as it can be. But nothing beats right. the real crack of an AK forty seven through your windscreen. You know um, that changes the reality, <laughs> and then you know um, shit is real. You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but you know, like I said, you know, in my in my Incident, you know, it was it was it was a short short period of time, two minutes. I've got um, access to videos of cash and transit robberies that takes place for five, six, seven minutes of gunfire, where more than three hundred rounds are being fired between wow. you know the the guys inside a vehicle and the robbers from the outside in. So it's a you know, that's not an incident. You don't talk about 300 rounds on a, on a crime scene as an, as an incident. It's a, it's a bloody war. Right. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing, man. So what, so you, you're talking about your training and the things that you guys offer. Do you offer training that dovetails with the experience that you had or, and, and was this the first experience of this type that you've had working out there or? Obviously, you know, when we, supply our training or provide our training, everything is um, client specific. So if we train cash and transit companies, we train them for a gunfight inside, from inside the cab to the outside. If the vehicle are being shot out and disabled, 
and they can't maneuver with the vehicles. They need to um, debus and then take the fight um, on foot. So we train all of them in, in that um, environment. It doesn't help on training them to be an armed reaction officer when they are going to face 20, 20, 20 to 5 um, armed assailants firing at them with AK-47s, you know. So the realism of our training needs to be there. Otherwise, we are not serving any purpose and we are not doing the, you know, the students and the members out there any favor. Yeah. No, I giving agree, them as, yeah. Yeah, giving them a false sense of, you know, ability and achievement and security. And when, yeah. when, when, the, when, the, when the things comes down, then he, does, then he starts realizing, I don't have the skills to, to manage it. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. I think that's one of the really important things of really understanding the pedigree of the people who are training you, you know, because people that have really been through it have the conviction of making sure you get training that can save your life. And they have the experience, you know, to be able to differentiate, well, yeah, this is the schoolboy way, but this is the way it really goes down. You know, and I got to see that when I got to my unit in the Marine Corps and all my big brothers had just got back from the Battle of Fallujah and they were like homicidal maniacs, but they knew how to fight, <laughs> you know? And yeah. then I got to see the conviction in their eyes you know, when they looked at me and showed me, you know, missing arms and things. And they're like, if you don't learn, if you don't listen to us, you will die. And, yeah, oh, exactly. months, go back over uh, there, you know, and that was so valuable. Um, yeah. I think now yeah. in the world, so much social media, it's, it's very important to know who you're learning from. But anyways, go ahead. Yeah, but you've mentioned, you know, there's, there's some policemen security officers that will go through an entire lifetime and never draw his weapon in, in the line of duty. And the biggest, the biggest um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for here? The biggest drawback for them is by being complacent. Complacency of thinking, you know, it won't happen to me, it won't happen here, it won't happen to us, that type of thing. That's an absolute um, complacent mindset, and that that mindset will kill you because yeah. it takes it takes your takes your focus away, it takes your mind out of the fight, um, and it takes your mind away from reality. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. It makes you psychological. It makes you vulnerable on so many different levels. Yeah, I, know. I, th I think transitioning from military. I had those instinctive skills to know, like scaling, you know, a room when you walk into the room and kind of looking for the exits and so on and so on. I think that definitely helps, you know, I, do, I use that all the time, even in EP. When I go into a restaurant, I wonder where the exits are at, or I want to know, or I, I face towards the door, you know, so I already can see people coming and going all the same time. And I'm never caught by a surprise, I guess, you know, yeah. so being aware of your surroundings, that, that, yeah. you know, the Marine Corps definitely taught me that. Always head on a swivel, always, you know, being where your surroundings. And yeah. I, 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 I implement that into every detail I ever do. Yeah. Or yeah. even everyday life. When I go into a restaurant, I constantly force a habit. I just, I want to stay, you know, close, you know, away from the, you know, if I'm, I want to stay facing the door, you're knowing where the exits are, entrance. Right, I think you can relate to that as well. Um, yeah. And it's just, uh, and even when I'm by myself or I'm with a friend or a female, whatever, Lead, when I lead someone into a, in a, when I walk into a building, I'm leading as if I'm leading them that as my principal, you yeah. know, or, 100%. or, ta or tailing them for that matter. hundred percent. I think, yeah. and that's why, that's why the stinking slogan here, man, is it's more than just a job. It's a lifestyle. Cause it's literally like, you can't just think you're going to turn these habits on and these baselines of performance on and like, this this unconscious competence that you should have you're not going to just turn that on when you're working right. and turn it off when you're not working you know and you're with your family or your loved ones it's like real protectors yep. like we go to work and we do what we do in real life and then what makes us gangster and like really good at work is the fact that like we're putting hours in the gym we're putting hours on the mat we're putting hours in the range like and then yep. and then when you get to work it's just like yeah like this is easy this is game time but i'm just gonna do who i am right now 
<laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I've been told before, like you're too intense. Calm down. Like yeah. you're not a worker right now. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, I just forced to have it. I apologize. You know, it's just exactly. Crazy. Cause yeah. I'm not a stoic robotic guy. I actually have a personality, you know? So I'm just not like, Oh, you know, like, you know, yeah. left, right. You know? Um, but like, I'm not programmed, but at the right. same time I am in my own head when I'm, you know, moving around and stuff like that. Yeah. No, you know, it's constantly thinking, anticipating my next move, you know, hundred percent. and that's huge yeah. in our game, dude. I think, I think a lot of, especially newer dudes in the game get sucked into whatever task they're doing. Like, all right, principals at dinner, like we're going to like watch them at dinner. It's like, yeah, dude, but do you know what the next two moves are? Do you know how you're getting to your vehicles? Are the yep. vehicles ready right now? Yep. You know, have you swept the green room, bro? Like, do you know that that path is clear where you're going, dude? Like, do you know how to get to where we're going after we get to the green room, just in case they just want a quick turnaround and burn straight to the VIX. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, you're, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. It makes us better men, better protectors, better women. I, I dig it, man. So what happened after, after the Marine Corps? Corps? So after the Marine Corps, um, I uh, I trans, uh, basically, I can put some size on the Marine. I went to the Marine Corps, like 175 pounds, and I got out like 230. Yeah. Like I was just jack and steel eating, you know, all the time, you know, and. Uh, Heck yeah. I put on some size, some serious size. Temporary. And I'm about 235 right now. That's what's um, up. Yeah. And that's why I kept my fitness up and all that. Um, so I was a big dude when I got out of the Marine Corps and I was like, yeah. oh man, you know? And so I was automatically, I basically just identified like, well, this guy could do security, you know? And yep. I was looking for work. I didn't have a job. Yep. I got out of the Marine Corps. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. And so I just started bouncing at bars, you know? Yeah. Uh, and cracking some heads for a while. I mean, I did, unfortunately, but, yep. you know, cracking heads and whatnot. And then um, did it for a long time. And then I was yeah. like, man, there's no, I mean, you know, there's no money in bouncing, you know? Like, right. Um, I need to get into the club scene. So then I started working the door nightclubs and now you're getting cash tips and now you're like, okay, now this is good. This is better. But I was in security for a while. Yeah. Um, bar security, bar, bar, bar club security, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I bumped into a guy um, who's a former Marine who did EP. And he was like, Hey man, have you ever thought about, you know, being doing, doing executive protection? And I'm like, what's that? Yep. And he's like, and he's like, well, it's like a glorified name for a bodyguard. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And he was with uh, one of the big companies at the time. Yeah. And I was like, you should definitely try out and you should definitely, um, you know, okay. see what you're made of. And I was like, yeah, man, I mean, I'd love to do it. He's like, the money's great. You can travel. He's like, you're single, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm single, no kids, no family. You know, he's like, oh, perfect. You know, you'd be great. And so I guess working in the nightclubs, like, now keep in mind, I, I got out of the Marine Corps and I, was, I went to LA. I was in Hollywood. I been and I was in Hollywood up until like, so I went home for like, I went back East for like two years to go to school. And then I went back to, I went to Hollywood. So I bounced, started bouncing back East, like Massachusetts area. And then when I decided to move back to LA, um, I went right into Hollywood. I'm talking like lived on Sunset Boulevard in the heart of Hollywood. In like, the game. In, in the thick of it. I was in the thick of it. Yeah. And I was there from 1999 until 2020. Yeah. In Hollywood. 1999 to 2020. Yeah. And that's how you were introduced to me when one of the homies was like, yo, this dude's been big in the Hollywood scene, you know? And I'm like, long okay, time. Dude. Yeah. yeah that's, yeah. A, that's a beast, man. The that's Hollywood a beast. Scene. Yeah. But I also got like, I mean, you know, Hollywood is like, you can go to the grocery store and there's a celebrity right there. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's not, it's so common there. So right. I became desensitized to that. I wasn't a star, I wasn't starstruck or anything like that. Right. But then I'm working at these nightclubs and they're coming in the front door. And yeah. then I meet their management and I meet this and I meet that. And then I'm asked, Hey, do you do anything on the side? Yep. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I'll do, pers I'll, I'll do side security. Yeah. You know? And uh, so I had to go through all the criteria and get my, you know, get my guard card and get all that, get all the exposed weapons permit, all that type stuff. Right. And so I have the credentials, if you will. Right. But then they were like, Oh, you're a Marine. Oh, background. Oh, oh you know, like, Oh yeah, we want, you know, we want, but then they're like, cool, I'll pay you, you know, 20 bucks an hour. And I'm like, what? I was like, no, I'm not doing 20 bucks. <laughs> no, <Yeah. laughs> no, no, not at all. The select so that's, that's just how it is, you know? Yeah. Um, and even now I get, you know, I've heard people tell me that, oh yeah, well, I can pay you $25 an hour. And yeah. I'm like, no, I'm like, right. sorry, but I'm not the guy. I'll find yeah. you somebody, but I'm not that guy. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I guess seeing these familiar faces coming in the nightclub and I was dealing with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis as far as, their management and then the, the actual principal would be like oh hey man you're good they always like dab me up and stuff when they come in it's not 
And then it was cool. And then that, that kind of transitioned into other stuff as well. Right. So just my face was familiar in Hollywood. People knew me a lot. And yeah. so I guess when I started getting into the field of EP, it was not an easy transition, but I was able to get some work that way. You nice. know, like, hey, we'll, we'll try him out. You know, he seems like he's got a good head on his shoulders and he knows how to handle people and this one and so on. And so I was very fortunate for that. I got some work there. Yeah. And then I started getting all sorts of different types of client demographics. Yeah. I worked with some Saudi royalty and, you know, and then I started meeting other EP guys and they were like, Hey, you know, I have this principal coming in. We need a third guy on the detail. You know, do you want to do it? And I'm like, yeah. You know, I started like you, you don't pass up any job. I yeah. was taking, I mean, I was like, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll do event security. I'll do this. Yep. I, mean, I did whatever I could. I just walked wanted. through all the doors, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. I did residential for like yeah. a year. You know, and I was like, which is, which is great. Cause you get to know like how to, you know, handle Assistance exteriors of, structure. you know, people's building, you know, uh, homes and all that stuff. And, you know, admitting vendors and so on and so on. And, you know, it, it was cool. You know, it was, it was experience. Yeah. Um, I don't like it, but right. I do it, you know. Would you mind just kind of going into that background of yours briefly? Sure. I'll start, I'll start from like my years as a protection agent. And I started as a federal law enforcement agent. Um, in the awesome. United States Secret Service under George Bush Sr. So you can get an idea of how old I am. Um, and that was quite short-lived. It was just about a 13-month thing for me. And you'll have to read my book to understand and um, know what happens. Um, and then what happened because of that was I went into the, the world of private uh, contracting and I really bounced back and forth between um, private protection, executive protection, and investigations. My book that you mentioned, The Protector, um, with that long subtitle, is about my years as a protection agent um, and all the you know interesting missions I did. Everything from you know families, uh, wealthy Fortune 500 families, to what I'd say some of the shitholes of the world, like Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, Bogota, Colombia, which at the time was the kidnapped capital of the world, uh, Lima, Peru, right after um, Abamael Guzman, who was the head of the Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path, right? Like literally we were there within two weeks of his arrest and they were still retaliating against the U.S. and bombing hotels near us. And it was, you know, a little bit of a shit show. But th as you know, like uh, we thrive and I thrive on adrenaline rushes. And it was like, you know, okay, I made it home alive today. And there were tanks parked out like in Lima, Peru, there were tanks parked outside in front of our hotel. And we were told constantly, oh, there's a threat. You can't go out. I go, well, so I'm going to sit here as a sitting duck. Yeah. You know, no way. So I'd go out, and I'd be like the only person in a restaurant or the only person walking the streets, you know? Yeah. Um, and then after my stint in Haiti, uh, which was 95, 96, I kind of got a little bit burned out. It's not the best word for it, but we'll just call it that. And I went back and got my master's in forensic psychology. Uh, that was a two year endeavor. And I started to work. And so I ended up, that was the end. Uh, I graduated at the end of 99 and moved to San Diego. And I was working in the field of, you know, stalking, anti-stalking. And then 9-11 happened about a year and a half, two years later. And I ended up becoming one of five instructors in what's called the uh, Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program. It's a U.S. State Department program. Okay. It was started way before, but they were moving their program uh, from D.C. to a much bigger facility so they could expand it. And they moved that to Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I did that for a year and a half, three weeks out of the month. And we say we trained friendly foreign nationals because they were vetted by the State Department, which was not always the case. But um, we won't talk about those stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, then I got an offer from the U.S. Embassy in Bogota, Colombia, and uh, to work as the U.S. Security Advisor to the Minister of Defense of Colombia, which was probably the highlight of my career, like the most challenging, the most dangerous, uh, had a bounty on my head. My teammates and I did. We were three people and then turned into four once one year later into that, just as yours truly was getting bored and was about to leave, we got a whole huge influx of money into our budget. And so we started a training academy down there, sort of like our version of, you know, the federal law enforcement training center. Yeah. Um, so I did that. And I said, okay, I won't leave until I train every single member on the team, you know, the president's team, the vice president's team and the minister of defense's team. So I stayed in total two and a half years. Wow. Yeah. And then eventually, um, cause that was, Oh, 
three to 05, I came back, I was working with an investigative and protection firm. And then I met my now husband and merged lives about a year after um, starting to date to the East Coast, which was like, okay, watch my face. Like, ew, like as a super (laughs) independent woman, I'm moving and giving up my position, you know, for a guy, you know, Mm -hmm. but what I ended up doing then is was like, okay, because his his daughter, you know, was living there and then she was living with us. And so I was like, okay, as a to, for me, because I was losing my um, equity in a, in the firm and I was losing my position because we had to be physically there. And so I was like, OK, that's when I made my decision to go back and get my doctorate. I was like, I got to do something for me because I've just kind of uh-huh. lost my livelihood. Like gave it away. I could have gone back into contracting, but I just wasn't appealing to me at the time. So at the time I was like, OK, well, this is the time then I'm going to get my doctorate. Yeah, so that was 08. And I graduated um, with my doctorate in 13. And so since then. I still consult in stalking. I still consult in some forensic stuff. I still consult a little bit in protection, but not as much anymore. But really, I'm focused more on teaching now. Um, I teach at the George Washington University in D.C. because they're online and I currently live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I teach abnormal psychology and the psychology of crime and violence. That latter course I created, as I was talking to you earlier, and um, they allowed me to teach it. It's pretty interesting. A lot of blood and gore. Um, yeah. psychology behind the, you know, the minds of the criminals. And I also do a lot of consulting. So I do mental health trainings. I have a lot of clients, um, mostly now virtual, but so yeah, that's kind of my life currently. Yeah. yeah. It's a crazy wow. path, huh? It's beautiful. <laughs> it's outstanding. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot. It's busy. a lot. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of mountaintops and a lot of really yeah. interesting things done, you know? Yeah. Like I yeah. said, that's the way we're supposed to live for sure. And I can't wait to dig into you the uh, psychology and then the stalking things, you know, so we'll yeah. Get, sure. Yeah. So who, one of my favorite questions, who are you at your core underneath mm-hmm. the work? Yeah. Stubborn. <laughs> uh, I kind of get that sense. To be yeah. <laughs> uh, determined, a woman of integrity. It's probably my biggest uh, thing. It's not just honesty, it's integrity. It's like doing the right thing and uh, even when people aren't looking, is what I say. Um, it's really different. It's it overlaps with honesty, but it's still very different. And it's like kind of like being able to look in the mirror, you know, and know you're a, that you're a good person. But um, yeah, I would say all of those things. And I, you know, cl- clearly uh, determined and um, driven, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that's me. Outstanding. I'm a lot of fun in my core too, but you know, it's that yeah. whole balance, you know, work hard, play hard. So Heck yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Intense. I dig it. How did you get into this? And then, yeah, break us, break it down, man. Where have you been? So, uh, you know, I came up, uh, and like I said, even though I was a natural protector, I never saw myself entering this field or being a bodyguard or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Um, I came up uh, just like a normal kid. Um, you know, I'm originally from, you know, Washington, D.C., I come from a military background. My, my dad was in the army, did 20 years. So I traveled abroad. I was in Germany for two and a half years, a uh, few uh, stops in, in, in the U.S. Uh, so I was I was already acclimated in, you know, different uh, races, cultures and all that, just being, you know, a military brat, if you will. Yeah. Um, coming up, uh, I loved, like, the whole excitement, the military excited me. So I had uh, I had dreams of possibly entering, you know, his footsteps. And, yeah. You know, but my whole thing, I, I, when I looked at it, I wanted the, the Rambo. I'm a little older, so, you know, I came up under, you know, those type of movies. Yeah, I'm with you, bro. Just, Back when man, just, acting heroes were actually men. Yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. I can I can get into so, this movie because this is a man with muscles doing yeah. manly stuff on TV. Yeah. Like, I can actually appreciate yeah. this. Nowadays, I'd be clicking through Netflix and... for I'd be clicking for, through Netflix for three hours trying to find trying a movie find, yeah, that yeah, I can yeah, relate yeah. with because it's all like you know, like like dudes yeah. the way as much as my yeah. It, I don't want to get too crazy, but, <laughs> but anyway, I feel you on that. I feel you on that. Anyway, go ahead. So, uh, came up. You know, athletic, you know, sports was very big, you know, football in my life. And um, and then I got into music, mm. music real heavy. You know, the rap scene had just uh, exploded and uh, I wanted to be in the rap industry. In the scene, yeah. Early on, you know, I wanted to mm. be in the scene as, a, as an artist. So, um, 
you know, dibbled and dabbed a little bit. Uh, actually, uh, my father is originally from Long Beach, California. Okay. So when I moved out there, I met a person um, named Snoopy, who would later oh. grow up to be Snoop Dogg, Doggy Dog. And yeah. uh, we had a group. And uh, yeah. he, Warren G, myself, and early on, we was trying to shop demos and try to get signed. And it just didn't work out for me. I, I was impatient. And, yeah. you know, um, my mother and father were going through a, a split. My mother was from D.C., my dad, so East Coast, West Coast situation. And um, mom's was like, look, you need to come back home with me, you know. So it was like a, you know, a, a paternal oh, tug of war. Yeah. And so I decided to go back home. And um, when I got back home, um, D.C. in that time was a real bad place, you know. Sure. Yeah, it was real bad, you know, with the drugs and the crime and everything. And I kind of, you know, got caught up in that mixture. OK. And, um, you know, made some mistakes, had to had to deal with those situations and all that. Yeah. And um, I learned a lot. But over the course of time and, and through the years, I had established myself as being like a, a, a well-respected individual in my community and you know, just the places that I went to. So yeah, I had a voice. I had a, a, a level of respect. Um, some people feared me, but I would rather be respected than feared. But right. it was just that um, years later when I was trying to find out like a real, a real direction, because like I'm saying, at that point, the music, I was getting too old and I knew that that dream wasn't going to basically materialize. Mm -hmm. And so, um, move. so I had... Uh, a guy Washington DC got their really first official rapper, you know, by the name of Wale, who yeah. went really mainstream and everything. And he was just starting out. And um it became a time where he needed somebody to move with him. And so initially I came aboard just to make sure he was good. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't really know so much about, you know, like the what protection. a bodyguard was, yeah, the protection thing. But the of it. I, I've done enough. Yeah, I've done enough in life to just know how to recognize stuff, how to identify stuff, how to. Uh, and, and the biggest thing, what people think is, is it's not about just always uh, the re. Yeah, it's about the action. Yeah, not the reaction. The proactive. So like, proactive. Yeah, and so you know, I can I can shut down a lot of things without having it to even. You know, even take it there, if you will. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Just just by making certain calls, having certain meetings, pulling up on certain people. And so that's what I was doing. And then I just realized, I said, well, you know what? Uh, really, when I looked at the overall thing, I was becoming a bodyguard and didn't realize. Yeah. So I was like, well, you know, I need to be compensated for this or, or something if I'm going to be out here doing it. So that's what led me into it in, in over the years. Like um, like I said, I did have that connection with Snoop, so I got with his uh, um, I got with his security, mm -hmm. who is a, is a relative of his, and you know, a guy named Papa Thomas Brighter. But Papa's been with Snoop now for like over twenty something years, and he's like an OG in the game. Yeah, you know, on, on our standpoint, and uh, he basically showed me the ropes. You know, I, I didn't like I said, I came in, I didn't really know what I was doing or what I should be doing. But he kind of like he 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 polished me up and he put yeah. me and then it was just trial and error, you know. Every day that I went out, I didn't always do things right. But yeah. one thing about me was that I like to learn, and so yeah. I would go back and I would self analyze myself and I would critique critique my performance. Mm -hmm. You know, like even if I was out and um, you know an individual got up on a client close enough to like, hey, can I get a picture? I would look at that like, damn, how did I allow that? Like. You know, how did they, yeah. they even get that close? So, and I do that to this day. You know, I see right. where I make mistakes because I, I still make them today. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm not perfect, no, but I strive perfect. to be and to, and to perfect myself. And, and then I, I looked at a lot of anything I can get my hands on that I thought was informative. And, and mm -hmm. you know, that's what I would do. And, you know, in and, 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 and my field, like um, recommendation is everything. Yeah, and, and your and your reputation is everything. So when I'm out here dealing with these individuals, and like my my forte is like high end clients on the entertainment side, and you know they're all friends. They it's, it's it's a network of people. Oh, and so I 
So they recommend me, you know, and so from there, you know, I'm doing something for somebody else and then I'm doing something for somebody else. And then it's to the point where I, I'm only one person. I can't even do it. So now it's like when I need to try to get some guys, you know, don't leave no money on the table. So right. now I need to try to incorporate some guys that can facilitate those needs when I'm unable or unavailable. So this is what the whole gladiator protected. So, and it's fairly new, even though I've yeah. been in the game, like people look at me like, oh, he's been around forever. But it also dealing with specific clients, I missed a lot of work. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by that is like, you know, mm -hmm. I've been uh, while I was head of security for like 10 years. Yeah. I've been uh, part of uh, Snoop's detail now for like eight years. And what it does is that people see me and they know me, but it's like, well, he's already, he already with them. They're not going to check for me. Right. So I needed to let them know, yeah, I'm still available yeah. because there's downtime and I, and I, you know what I'm saying? So where it is now, I'm based out of Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people who come in, they automatically, you know, try to reach out to me. If I'm available, I will take, the, I will take it. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not, I will send somebody. And then there's some relationships that I've built that I don't even, if I'm not available, I'm just not available. Right. I'm yeah. not going to subcontract it. I'm not going because the re relationships are everything. And I'm just not saying, not saying that my guys are not worthy to hold a job, but I know the client. Right. And and we've come so far and like, I'm not going to let that be tarnished. So like, if I can't do it, then yeah. it's, it's, it's only a handful like that. You know, yeah. I try to accommodate who I can, but it's like I said, if I'm unavailable, then and, and, and a lot of times, with with the, if they're not my principal, they have their own detail anyway. Right. Or they have their own individual. And and, and my line of work is always, and this is why we it's, it's important to network and, right. and, and draw off each other because you still want that person from that terrain that can navigate you and your team, you know. Through yeah. so, you know, if you come to DC and you have a client, I'm going to follow your lead. Right. Yes. You might have just came into the game, you know what I'm saying? But that, that's your principle. Yeah. So I'm there to aid and assist you. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where a lot of people, they, 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 the ego they gets their it. egos won't, yeah, the ego won't allow that. So, I mean, in short, that's basically just, just my story. I've been, I've been mm -hmm. doing this, I've been, um, like I said, over a decade now. Um, I would like to say I've, establish myself or at least a, a name for myself and now it's about building my own brand because I've consumed myself with you know just my clients for so long and like I said I'm a I'm a I'm a of an older individual yeah. and I don't know how much longer that I can actually do this so I mean I can still do it from a different capacity. I might not have to be in the field but at least I can you know connect the dots and and, and be a general if you will. So yeah. I mean that's where I'm at right now. You know, I have to take the time out in the pandemic. The pandemic, that made me become aware of, you know, taking it to the next level. Cause you know, day to day, you know, it was good. And you can get, you can get swallowed up in that, like, in that lifestyle. Oh yeah. Cause you constantly going and all that. But when that pandemic hit and you had to slow down, you're like, well, hold on. I gotta have a backup plan. Cause this is bad. You know what I'm saying? So. That's the Thanks game. For the, uh, for the pandemic, if you will, just to, just to drape, bring out any positivity before, because it was so negative and everybody looked at it like that. So I tried to find some something positive in it. And that was just me eventually just taking the time and stop saying what I'm going to do and, and make it manifest. Boom! Quick shout out to our sponsor, Staccato. My first pistol sponsor. Um, I've been sponsored by a lot of companies, right, over the years. But when it comes to pistol, that's my bread and butter. Pistol is something I believe in. You know, I'm a competitive shooter. You know, we're shooting anywhere from, you know, 800 rounds a month type of thing, right? So Staccato, being what I believe, is one of, if not the most complete handguns you can put in your hand. Um, it's got every component that a handgun could have, should have. Uh, they're actually extremely dependable now that they've made some changes. And these things are straight up tack drivers. If you're looking for a pistol that will do as much of the work for you as a piece of hardware can, obviously you have to have the, the, the marksmanship and all the different things, but different guns perform at different levels. And I wanna say that Staccato is one of by far, for sure, take it from a competitive shooter, we're shooting the highest volumes of rounds constantly right now, not used to have a background guy, but like 
right now, when you go shoot, you're gonna see certain brands. Cicado is one of, if not the highest performing firearm that is both CCW, duty ready, and also competitive ready. So I wanna give them a shout out if you guys are looking for a good handgun to build your skills on top of, go check out Cicado. Much love and respect. Boom, when it comes to the technology you use to protect your home, there's nothing better than Deep Sentinel. AI driven, human monitored technology that will keep you and your family safe for the same price you're paying for whatever ring doorbell system you have. Check out Deep Sentinel. Um, it's such an honor to join forces with these guys. They should be in every single house in the world. Get real time Overwatch for you and your loved one. And for 10% off, depending on when you're watching this, don't forget to use code Byron at checkout. Boom, and to support this podcast, go to executiveprotectionlifestyle.com and contribute to our Patreon account. That Patreon account is what helps me make this podcast possible, contributing to this brand, what we're doing here, making it so that I can bring better guests on, making it so that we can plan more events and just expand the contribution to the private security industry and also to make an America a safer place. Do whatever you can, contribute whatever you can because it makes all of these things possible. Thanks for those contributions.